how do we prevent AI from thinking that we are the problem? Right. right? And right. it just gets to the point where it's maybe like, we don't need humans mm -hmm. in their current form because they're too slow, they're too physical. Right. And I see either some type of real strategy being done from these AI companies, or we're probably just going to become an organism that merges with them. It'll be a transitionary phase where we are this intelligence and complexity underneath the super intelligence. Yeah. And there's going to be a weird point where some human's going to be like, what if I join them? And then you get a point where right. how can you not join when so many have joined? It's like having an iPhone. Yeah, yeah. You, you take away your iPhone for a week, you notice how it's, yeah, it's become an extension of our body already. This is the Human Future Podcast, where we explore the intersection of technology and spirituality with some of the world's brightest minds. Together, we paint a vision of the desirable future and discuss the actionable steps to make that vision a reality. And now, without further ado, let's begin. Today, we are diving into a fascinating conversation with the multi-talented Karma, who is a Web3 DJ, musician, producer, and a community builder. We'll explore the intersection of music creation and technology, discuss the impact of digital tools and artistic expression, and venture out into the realm of decentralized organizing and the future of immersive digital experiences. Enjoy the show. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming, here. man. Yeah. It's uh, such an honor to have you here. I'm, I'm glad that you um, are in my life in general like it's cool to have you guys uh i know that we don't you know maybe interact that that often but i certainly see uh, what you guys are putting out uh, I, he I hear your music i, I see the uh, it's not about even just the music i feel like y you are part of a big movement uh, mm -hmm. of new movement uh of creators uh, creating a better space for creators to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and you're very much vocal about what you believe and what you promote and not only just saying things, but also doing them. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I see you guys really being involved in like building communities and um, uh, bringing change into the world, which is cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it takes one to see one, right? And I think you're creating a lot of these similar containers mm -hmm. for creators and creating spaces, which I think to me is the most interesting place to be in right now, more of this space building and container building than yeah. this funnel building that mm -hmm. we've become accustomed to. So super excited to be here. I got an early glimpse of the cool, man, studio yeah. a while back and yeah. I'm, I'm hyped to be here. Cool, yeah. So would you mind telling me a little bit about how you ended up uh, creating music? What's your kind of backstory? Because I don't know if I you've ever shared that with me. For sure. Yeah. So music has been the thing I think I was most resonating with as a child. I was born in Vancouver, Canada. My parents were pretty hippie. They they named me Karma for for God's sake and. They would take me to a bunch of concerts because they were young parents and they told me I would just watch the musicians and just like stare at them. And I think it was the first language that I really connected with. So I remember seeing this bassist called Jaco Pastori and my mom is like, you're like, I want boss. I want boss. And my parents looked at me like, how are we going to get this kid at bass? So bass is like the largest instrument. Uh -huh. He's three years old. Yeah. And they got me this little guitar. And I was always like, I wanted a bass, though. <laughs> and they're like, I never lived that down. Yeah. And I picked up a little drum set that my, grom my grandma got me from the toy store. And mm -hmm. that was my first exposure to music. It was very much communal, based in playing with my family. My dad played in bands growing up. Mm. And... Around the time I was seven or eight, I was way more interested in what bands were doing, in the counterculture side of things. Mm. And I started taking it more seriously and more professionally. Mm. So I grew up playing in bands throughout middle school and high school, nice. recorded some albums. As the music industry itself was transitioning from the CD model to more of streaming, so mm -hmm. saw a lot of how the economics and the technology was playing into music. Yes. Around that time, I'm also really challenging myself of where do I want to be in music? Do I want to be just mm. in front on the stage? Do I want to make music to play live? Am I interested more in the recording side of things? Mm -hmm. So 
I definitely got interested in recording. I used to think about it as just this big red button that we'd go in with my band and <laughs> write songs in the studio. And then I'm like, oh, there's a whole other yeah, side to yeah, here. Yeah. And I really just went down the rabbit hole in high yeah. school and turned the computer into my music partner, which was really fun because I was always reliant on other band members and mm-hmm. there's a whole coordination side to it as well. Mm-hmm. So went back to more of this like solo creator, uh, creative process for a while and then it came full circle and I had my own project and my fiance and I also have Karma Violetta which is a duo project so a little bit more taking from my band roots and Mm -hmm. that's my history of music it's very much been yeah from a place of intuition more so than something that was forced on me and then once I had that intuition it was turned into more of a profession, which is mm-hmm. something I still play with that dynamic a lot. Like, what is it like to turn your art into a profession? Nice, yeah, and then um, did, were you at all trained on any instruments uh, or you you learn on your own type? So yeah. I very much grew up in like a hippie, everyone jams type of way. Yeah. And when I was in my bands, I did start having guitar lessons. That's so right. I had a great guitar teacher named Dice Kimura and he was trained classical guitar but then got more into metal and rock so i had a lot of that exposure and i am super grateful for having some of that guitar training it definitely Mm -hmm. wasn't classical but it was Mm -hmm. some of the music theory side i needed and from that foundation i started teaching myself other instruments especially as i started producing music i very much gravitated to the keyboard which i had never played but it allowed me to write for all of the different sections Uh so yeah, YouTube tutorials. Nice. That was a big thing for me. Nice, nice. I don't know if I've ever shared. Uh, I played piano for eight years. Wow. That was like a, a proper music education. Um, I was uh, in choir for a little while. I knew how to be a, like, a, how do you call conductor. that? A conductor. Wow. and stuff. Yeah, so I had that training in, in school. It's been so many years. I won't play. I won't be able to play even a simplest song anymore. I haven't played in like maybe. T- but I'm sure if I spend some time like, remembering and things uh, you'll come to me uh, oh for sure yeah oh i think it's it's definitely ingrained and i think music is something that everyone has some type of communication with mm-hmm. whether it be through consumption of music mm-hmm. or just singing in the shower yeah and yeah i really relate to that because i think violetta had a similar story where she had more of a classical upbringing Mm -hmm. and i had a lot of friends that did go through the same thing Mm -hmm. and for some of them it worked out really well where they were able to make it through that grueling process but others actually took the passion out of them i noticed um and that almost happened to me a little bit with my band once it got very professional because mm-hmm. it felt more like work. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't know that, but that's a, mm-hmm. that's a great... How do you keep um, that still as a, something that drives your passion and, and not keep it as work, like even now, like since you're really committing to, to it and putting all of your energy into mm-hmm. it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I read a book by Cal Newport. Um, so good they can't ignore you, which kind of dispelled the notion of passion and how like following your passion shouldn't even be the thing mm. that we should be doing, which is very counterintuitive to me because I was always told like follow your passion, go yeah. against. And I think passion is a byproduct of interest and curiosity mm-hmm. and competency at a specific skill. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's been more of that. How can I turn music into a practice? And the thing I struggle with more is the content and distribution side not affecting the creative process because Mm -hmm. they're so intertwined, Mm -hmm. not being in the studio and creating from a place of what is the audience gonna think? How am I distributing this? And it's always a work in progress because Mm. that to me is the thing that creators and this whole creator economy struggle with the most where Mm. all of our individual disciplines have turned into just content Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Most of the content isn't long form like this, which to me is my favorite type of content. Mm -hmm. It's these quick bursts of these are the three tips to play better chord progressions or these are the three tips to film better. And any real passion and practice is so much deeper than that. It's something that you struggle with, you play around with. So I'm still working on that every day. And I don't know what the answer is. You know, I I, I don't know if I would tell someone like, yeah. Keep your passion as a passion, make it a business. I think it's an individual journey, but yeah, I think it's a great question to be asking yourself every day. For sure. Yeah, I s- 
when I quit corporate, um, I certainly followed uh, at least something that I would do more passionately about. It, it may be, yes, I did follow the passion of photography and visual art creation and things like that. Uh, but then I, I was very practical uh, not to go the route of um, just a very, very creative photographer. I mean, you could still be a very, very creative photographer, uh, do like editorial type work and um, make a good living. Uh, I saw though, there, there is a trend of that industry kind of dying out because of the whole industry of magazines and things mm. like that. Like, it's changing um, and everything is shifting to the digital and um, uh, there are different business models. So, um, so the editorial photographers uh, are kind of the whole industry is slowly dying out. Um, not to say you can't make money there, but it's just hard. It becomes harder and harder and harder. I think um, mm. they're, they're just becoming, I feel like more more independent like you, you have to have your own projects and be recognized and be your own like a uh, personal brand influencer type and, and monetize all of that stuff instead of like going to a big magazine that will pay you a lot of money for, for your work. You think that's where like most of it is headed where having your own brand and leveraging that gives you the work gives you the opportunity it's so interesting it's very similar in music where mm -hmm. back in the day maybe you could be a completely obscure producer mm -hmm. and be doing really well there's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I see it as a broader trend, right? I see it even as startup founders, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the startup founders, most of the marketing comes yeah. from their personal brands. Right. So, yeah, that's yeah. There's a whole uh, notion of decentralization and uh, perfect timing for uh, blockchain technology to flourish and to exist. I mean, now we're in this kind of a winter time, but it it, it, sound, it feels like it will be summer at some point in the near future once all of the th things like AI and mm -hmm. uh, metaverse and all of this thing s starts to uh, uh, in intersect. I think um, uh, uh, blockchain will play a major role again in in piecing it together and, and piecing together the physical world and the digital world. The more we um, blur the line, especially like mixed reality and things mm -hmm. like that. And so there's the whole notion of decentralizing any kind of uh, organizational structure and and have them a, a lot more like a fabric and and not like it's a it's a much more flat than than a hierarchical mm -hmm. structure um, in anything that we do. Yeah, I mean in music and art, uh, uh, in the way how people work. Like I I see uh, large projects. You would still need uh, people to collaborate, but they don't come together in this in the same way where there's a one centralized authority that says, "Oh, you come, you come, you come, you come." It's uh, maybe there is a component of decentralized system that people plug themselves in, and then in collaborative way they're self self organized like that. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think what you're mentioning about most of the structures being top down mm -hmm. and you see most of society reaching its limits in those top down structures mm -hmm. and you see the distrust in a lot of those structures and you have on the one side the extreme version of that would be pure totalitarianism, right? Like pure yeah. centralization. On the other side you have pure decentralization which if you can have the self-emergent coordination systems, which I do think is the future of organizations, right? Where mm -hmm. somehow you have reputation built in, somehow you have this work economy where people can come into an organization that they want to contribute in. You can see previous history mm -hmm. and you can have coordination mechanisms for it. And it's a lot of the structures we've been playing around with. I think it's very much the early days of those experiments. And I think experiments like that were happening um, whether it be like communes, whether it be like small tribal governance structures, yep. and the the like externalities of pure decentralization can also be pure catastrophe, right? Like mm. pure just chaos. So mm -hmm. I think the point that I've seen the most failure happen with these orgs is mm. the coordination piece mm -hmm. and how do you align incentives between mm -hmm. all these different parties. Yep. And to me, that's the most interesting work to do because mm -hmm. It's the work we need to do on a global scale. You see it happen between countries. It mm -hmm. happened between companies. And that's where I've been spending a lot of my time in. And when we talk about this individual creator economy, to me, I want to see this collective economy, nice. this squads of people, these collectives of people coming together to release mm -hmm. and support the individual work, mm -hmm. right? So maybe we're both releasing 
music, we're releasing media, yep. but we're supporting each other along yep. that process. Yep. And maybe together we have an output as a collective itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of what we've been exploring with music, with art, with developers and seeing how does all these things converge into one. Mm -hmm. And we've only been able to do it through small experiments so far because I think those are the people that build the theory. The practitioners usually inform the theorists. Yeah. And I'll tell you that definitely like the summer, the winter that affects things and yeah. all the same human conflict bubbles up in those areas. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been really fun to try to, mm -hmm. to, try to solve for and just mm -hmm. practice. What type of experience have you run and what type of results have you uh, experienced? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I was just spending time on Twitter around 2020, 2021, I, see, I saw a lot of these DAOs popping up yep. and there was a lot of DAOs that were more on the finance side of things. Mm -hmm. And there was even the Ethereum DAO back in the day, but mm -hmm. there wasn't so much cultural side of DAOs. And mm -hmm. this cycle of crypto and blockchain, there was a lot of musicians and artists coming up with these collectives and mm -hmm. trying to coordinate through voting mechanisms and mm -hmm. economic models. Mm -hmm. And I found this one community called Song Camp First that was a mix of a writing camp. So think like a Nashville writing camp, but a bunch of musicians get together yep. in a house and they write songs and then they get them either mm -hmm. placed in different artists' catalogs or they mm -hmm. release them themselves. And then the other side, which I thought was really interesting was it was kind of like an incubator hackathon, like mm -hmm. kind of like a Y Combinator accelerator. Mm -hmm. And you're bringing both these people together. You had these developers, these designers, and then you also had all the musicians cool. and you had the operators of the DAO that were nice. thinking about how are we going to coordinate everything? How are we going to create economic models that reward everyone? Very cool. And everything was being collectively released as that structure itself. I'll either be Song Camp. Yeah. We came up with another um, band called Chaos, which was 77 members. Okay. Cool. And it was a headless band concept where mm. there was this research paper published on headless brands and how things like Bitcoin or mm -hmm. Ethereum mm -hmm. had become this brand that there was no top down mm -hmm. approach and it was widely known. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to see if we could do something similar with music to see if the collective, mm -hmm. the sum of the parts could create more, the whole could become more than the sum of the parts. And we released 50 songs and we built a whole front end, the back end. We, did, we experimented with like UBI models and economic mm -hmm. distribution. Mm -hmm. And that got me really excited around these collective models. And Song Camp had been doing camps every uh, couple months. So there was one called Electra before this chaos one. Mm -hmm. And just seeing them experiment with that, I wasn't even part of Electra. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to create this container for myself and people around me. And I started this thing called Wave World, which mm -hmm. very much is emergent, right? I think a lot of these organizations start as a seed. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like a rhizome where there's no top, there's no bottom. It's yeah. just you plant one thing and it just emerges and people come and you just start saying what you believe in and how you're yep. thinking about things and other people self-select to be there. Mm -hmm. And it formed this little core squad of five to seven of us where we yep. just started experimenting with collective creation, less so on making music, but more on the connection between fans mm. and the artists that they're listening to and these intimate performances and mm. taking all these digital experiences and mm. seeing how can we bring them back to the physical mm. to create a deeper connection and then full circle bring it back online mm -hmm. and one of the first experiments was this wave room concept where a bunch of people were collecting things online and collecting was starting to seem like this new form of a like, a deeper way of supporting, mm -hmm. where you're not just liking something or sharing it, but you're putting some financial backing and being like, I was here at this time, I wanna support this person. Right. But there wasn't much more to do with it. Uh -huh. And a bunch of people had these music collectibles in their wallet from mm -hmm. artists they wanted to support, mm -hmm. similar to buying a vinyl from someone you loved back in the day. Mm -hmm except these were programmable. So we wanted to create a physical experience where mm -hmm. these were your keys to the concert. Mm -hmm. You supported one of these artists and you could enter what we called the wave room, which was a mix of a tiny desk meets an NPR, um, tiny desk meets like an MTV Unplugged, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you were able to enter into this room, watch the artist perform. It was a curated set for just those fans. Sometimes they 
played unreleased music. Sometimes they told stories about what led them to get there. And we even played around with creating an economic incentive around that piece of media. So we filmed all the performances Mm -hmm. and we used split protocol so we can have every single person involved benefit from that concert. So the engineers, Mm -hmm. the people that helped make the concert happen, so some of the operators from Wave World, the artists, maybe mm-hmm. their DJ, maybe their band, mm-hmm. and even sometimes artists included their collector base. So mm-hmm. not only did you get to go to the concert for free mm-hmm. from supporting this artist early, mm-hmm. you maybe got paid to go to the concert. Mm-hmm. And even one artist, he included 200 people that couldn't make it to the concert. So they got paid mm-hmm. for just supporting this artist early. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and. To us, that was a super fun experiment. We also made the whole event outside of just that wave room super inclusive. So this idea of having anyone be able to come, we raised money from sponsors and amazing partners that helped make it happen, different protocols. And everyone got to come to this 2,000 person show and then this wave room, everyone had to pass it. So maybe you saw this thing was going down and you're like, oh, I wanna actually FOMO into this. I wanna like see this experience and that wave room concept is something we wanted to take and plug into different places. The uh-huh. the thing that we thought could scale. So we did another one in Miami, and now we've been exploring how does this wave room plug in to other events, right? What does a wave mm-hmm. room look like coming into Coachella or coming mm-hmm. into a completely different mm-hmm. landscape than what it was intended for? And for us, it was noticing that a lot of times trying to explain the technology to people or like sell them the technology is not the way. It's just yes, like yes, right. we had friends in the city and we're like, come to this concert. There's no talk of oh, anything right, else. Right, right, right. And and that's what we wanted to explore with Waverly, just this human connection piece and how can we use right. technology to empower that. Right, totally. I mean, in, speaking of the, the last point you said, uh, the talking about the technology is definitely not the approach for most people. Like, you, you don't talk about HTML and JavaScript when you're talking about the product that you're, like, selling, mm-hmm. you know, like, how you're de- de- delivering it. Do you see any similarities from uh, what you know? Like, you basically painted the picture how now there are f- first glimpses of people self-organizing in a new creative way in the kind of in the music music industry mainly, do you see that a transferable a self-organizing process for other types of groups also? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think mm-hmm. it happened first outside of music mm-hmm. and music is the one that I've experimented the most in, but mm-hmm. there's also a lot of research organizations or there's collective funds or syndicates, right? I think mm-hmm. the first people to really do it and the easiest place to do it is where it's pure finance, pure numbers, yeah. because everything is more transparent. Right. It's easier to value that type of work. It's easier yep. to know what an operator should be valued at as opposed to creative work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I have seen it really work in financial DAOs. So mm-hmm. instead of starting a fund that's completely private. You have a bunch of investors that invest in that fund. You don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's more participatory based. So there's a DAO or there's an on-chain organization and there's a treasury. Everyone can see what's in the treasury. Everyone can see what deals are being funded. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of that happen in the finance sector. There's been some photography DAOs Mm -hmm. that I've seen as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Similar to music where they'll either release collections together or all support one artist at a time. Mm -hmm. And to me, the most interesting place it's happening outside of art and culture and finance is in the regenerative Mm -hmm. space. So a lot of what Gitcoin is doing, thinking about how do we solve large scale problems and catastrophic risk? And whether it be in carbon markets or whether it be in agriculture, whether it be an existential risk from planetary boundaries, to me, that's very interesting. And I think the corporate structure doesn't allow for the full spectrum Mm -hmm. of solving problems. But ultimately, I think we still haven't figured out the coordination piece and most DAOs and most on-chain organizations haven't proven themselves out. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. I would say we're still at the stage where most of these experiments need to be learned from. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen something that can rival what is currently existing outside of right. the the ecosystem. Um, mm-hmm. That's where I'm. That's where I'm at. I saw like a lot of euphoria during the cycle, right. and 
you just see the same human errors you see at companies, right? And you see the mm-hmm. same um, problems emerge, but even more so because you're giving people this responsibility of governance and ownership that they yep. claim they want that a lot right. of times they don't really want, right, right, right? right? And you see the same thing in cooperative models, which mm. tried this experiment of mm. let's have everyone be an owner, mm-hmm. but then who's gonna do the work? And, and if you don't yeah. have this hierarchical structure, yeah. I think we're still building these coordination mm-hmm. mechanisms and it's still going to take a lot of trial and error. So for me, it's more how can we create a three month or a six month experiment mm-hmm. within a container to take mm-hmm. learnings from yeah. to see if we can extrapolate that. And even at Wave World, a lot of what we learned is seven people do most of the work. Yeah. And within that, it's more of an open model than right. a corporation, but mm-hmm. it's not this fully decentralized thing either, mm-hmm. right? And I think we haven't reached that yet, especially on the culture side, maybe yeah. more on the finance side, things have worked. Yeah, it sounds like uh, in order f- to go full steam on this uh, fully decentralized way of self-organizing uh, would be culture shift or mental shift of people taking responsibility, right? Like a lot well of people said. are still, uh, thing that oh somebody else will take care of that i can just cruise here um that still won't work even if you implement this new decentralized way of self-organizing right yeah and i think a lot of uh a lot of the same lower consciousness or like the parts of our consciousness that are more reptilian come into play where you have to solve for the selfishness. You have to solve for that rivalry that's going to emerge where everything's transparent. You can see what everyone's paid. Mm -hmm. And no one has fully figured that out, nor would I think there'll be this end-all solution. It'll be more within small organizations Mm -hmm. figuring out. And I think the reputation piece is going to be big. And you mentioned Mm -hmm. we're so accustomed to not owning things, to renting everything and not having that responsibility. Yep that it's going to be a big culture shift. And I think it's going to happen as a grassroots movement, similar to the open internet. Mm. And I think a lot of what was going on in the 90s was similar to what was happening now. It was kind of Mm. co-opted by these major corporations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and also thinking about the incentive systems of the business models, where Mm. to me, having this this organization that generates value together as opposed to the consumer or the product not being participatory based, but ultimately they turn into the product, which is a lot of where we live now, where Mm -hmm. I go on Instagram or even X or Twitter and I'm the product, right? I think that shift needs to occur for for more people to want to join these things. Right, right. It sounds like maybe we we might have to go through a f- either at least another wave or w- a couple more waves of uh, decentralization. It's it's now it's more decentralized, but it's definitely not de- fully decentralized. It's still f- like centralized. Mm-hmm. But um, so you, you have those leaps of new systems, new uh, culture or new m- mentality that enters the space and then you self-organize to some extent and then you exist in this state for a little while until you you notice that oh it's limiting now we need to, to have more decentralization and then you uh, yeah so it's almost like with this new um, new tools and new technology it opened up a new space that now became empty and then new participants starts to enter the space and the more and more participants enter the space that now it's become too crowded and then you're like oh now we're ready to expand to have have more freedom or more responsibility, like whatever mm-hmm. that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And just more experiments need to happen. More successful experiments mm. need to happen, where you have organizations that build, whether it be product, whether it be media, whether it be education, but it's actually impacting people at a larger scale mm-hmm. that gets people interested in being like, oh, mm-hmm. there's something actually going on here. Mm-hmm. Besides the financial upside, which mm-hmm. I see a lot of people fall into that rabbit hole. And maybe it's the thing that gets people in the door, but it shouldn't be the thing that keeps people there. Mm-hmm. And it's the same reason people will work jobs they don't want or, you yeah. know, and that same part of the human mentality. So it's not almost the decentralization piece that's missing. Mm-hmm. It's the coordination piece mm-hmm. that we're already suffering, you know, mm-hmm. in our traditional systems. And we're right. up against that. We need to work on outside of if decentralization worked, but even more so when it's fully exposed, right, where, right, where right, there right. is no top-down person controlling right. everything. So 
I think we're on our way there, and I think these experiments need to fail for us to learn from them to actually get there. For sure. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, when you were talking about, oh, build, uh, bring people from the digital into the physical and then a uh, uh, full circle back into the in, into the digital with the evolution of, um, you know, MR, a AR, VR technologies. Do you see uh, at all versions of the future in which maybe the, the, there won't be a need for a physical concert uh, because it will be so immersive, so realistic and and uh, connecting also. Like the, the big part is human connection, obviously why people go to see a f physical uh, being in there. But what if there is a, an experience uh, that is by your senses indifferentiable, uh, like you can't tell the difference if you actually seeing them or it's a hologram or some kind of a virtual and you're really feeling the presence as they're looking at, at you and things like that. Do you think uh, there, there might be a time where uh, all of the creators now, I mean, the positive thing that they can reach everyone at any point in a very meaningful way and also uh, there's no need to go anywhere anymore. Right, <laughs> right. I think it's, mo it's most probably likely, and if it is likely, statistically, we're probably already there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. this probably already is that, mm. if that's the case, right? Like, I think that's where the simulation theory yeah. goes in. I, I, I don't know what that gives us. Like, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like, in the sense of we're probably in that experience already if we're headed there. That's yeah. my thinking of it. Yeah. Um, and if it's indistinguishable, then in that case, 100%, we're getting the same yeah. connection piece. Right. Uh, it'll be interesting in the transitionary phase, right? Mm. Like we've played some metaverse concerts or whatnot, and mm. they're definitely not there yet. Totally. Yeah. But I watched like the Lex Friedman, Mark Zuckerberg one, and I'm like, right. oh, a year ago this was like just avatars, yeah. and now it's photorealistic. Right. So yeah. yeah, I think our generation is in the most interesting period where mm. all of these technologies are going to converge over each other, mm -hmm. and we're going to be faced with a lot of questions that we need to figure out from the abundance perspective as well. I think it's mm -hmm. just gonna be an abundance of information, an abundance of capital, sure. an abundance of media. And I do think we will reach that. I think for now, where we really found this taking the URL into the IRL or whatever you wanna call it, this online to the physical, mm -hmm. has been using that decentralized database mm -hmm. as a social graph itself. Mm -hmm. So because we've both, we've both used and made an entry into this database, let's say the Ethereum database, this mm -hmm. machine that's on everyone's hardware, we've met so many people. And mm -hmm. it's actually this human technology, the same way the internet social graph has allowed mm. people to meet and for us to coordinate to get here today and to distribute this. Mm -hmm. But there's intermediaries in between, you know, buying for your attention. Right. I think you, for us, it's been how do we use Ethereum as a social graph? And we have built some things like in Sandbox and some of these metaverse experiences. And we mm. definitely found that it's not there yet for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm interested to see as a musician, how can I collaborate with someone that's in Japan yeah. online? And mm. it's getting a lot closer. A lot of these mm. organizations, like this chaos band I was in, we were all over the world. We had people in India, we had people cool. in Australia. Cool. And the piece that's not there yet is kind of what you're working on, which is like now we feel this human connection piece and mm -hmm. we're looking at each other. That's I can't right. tell I'm being filmed. Right. How can you take what you're building here? That's right. Yeah. And that's the world I want to live in where we're not on Instagram talking, we're on something like this and yeah. I can call you up and right. exactly. that I'm interested in. And I totally. think if we can make that with a business model that's not right now an ad pops up, and there's this third party person vying for my attention and manipulating right. it. Right. I think that's a step towards progress. And it, then it's a real tool, you know, it's not mm -hmm. a manipulative tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the vision for this also is an extension of this kind of experience is, is a fully simulated VR experience in which you don't, your senses can't tell the difference if that person is not right in front of you. In fact, uh, you actually don't see me, right? You only see my reflection. Yeah. You don't re actually know if I'm here. 
yes, we walked in together. You remember your memory uh, allows you to know that I'm here and this is just a reflection. But what if I uh, ha so what if we didn't come together from from the same entrances and I had a, a very um, high definition, even just a 4K display uh, where you don't see the pixels. It's mm -hmm. as cr cr crystal clear of my image with no lag. Uh, I think it would be a fairly similar experience as you just looking into the mirror. I um, think so. I, even right now when you mention it, I'm like imagining it right now as if I was in mm -hmm. a simulation or a computer. Mm -hmm. And I love that thinking because mm -hmm. I think you should try it actually to try to see what happens if you come so, in through different doors. So check this out. So there is a TV that I, I just haven't had time to like, do enough uh, testing, but basically that was the idea to have a, a full scale uh, uh, display that can replicate my wow. size. And so I can be here uh, and then a remote person who is also looking straight into the camera through some kind of like a teleprompter or something while they're talking to you in, in high definition. Uh, for example, 4k tele teleconferencing is not even uh, available easily like there are no tool like easy c consumer uh, level tools there like corp um, yeah you know like uh, more for for corporations that I found some tools mm -hmm. but I just haven't got my, my hands on it like for some you have to have your own like um, infrastructure computer set up uh, that would like do this type of streaming it's not just like an app that you can do stuff stuff like that but uh, I'm sure we'll get to the point where you, you can do um, 4K or another alternative would be uh, having a an avatar f f fully like uh, photorealistic and and I'm sure you now have seen um, like f video fakes and stuff that deep fakes yeah deep fakes and stuff they're they're pretty like photorealistic uh, mimicking like facial expression and stuff so transmitting instead of like even transmitting the video over the internet and I think that's what they were doing uh, during the um, the Lex for uh, Lex podcast with the in in metaverse, mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they were transmitting just the coordinates of the change of the facial expression. So right. the latency is very low, and so you can really create like a. You don't have to have, first of all, high bandwidth, and also uh, you just have a model on each end that's very high definition, and you're just animating it here based on whatever coordinates being sent to it, type thing. Um, and then the same way now, the extent, this is a 2D experience. And now Im imagine then you can create a, a 3D avatar that uh, not only mimics uh, your face, but every kind of movement, it's accurately describing how you're moving. So now you can literally show up in any space and, and, and be yourself like that. And it, it could show you like a model of you. It, it could appro approximate, like it doesn't even have to track everything super precisely, but... Uh, like everyone's hands, like you don't really remember how my hands look. It right. doesn't really matter. Uh, but just general idea. Uh, main thing is really the the face, and then you can kind of just create uh, uh, a kind of a, a dummy avatar that just makes sure that the face is aligned with, and then whatever movement, like a like. Right. Know. Yeah. So, what has been the most challenging thing to get us there? Mm -hmm. Like, why is it happening now and why haven't we been able to do it before? Is it a technology piece? Yeah. Is it a bandwidth thing? Because I love the idea you're thinking about is like, how do we get there earlier than we can? Yeah. Yeah, I think the it's we're getting there very like um, at a good pretty decent pace uh, and it's uh, graphic like a uh, rendering mm. real-time rendering of uh, high uh, fidelity type of imagery like uh, Nvidia is doing a lot of progress and uh, you know the uh, Unreal Engine and uh, what's the other one uh, they're all having uh, uh, so video game industry is really pushing that mm -hmm. uh, and will forward. Um, I, I keep a close eye on like the latest uh, innovation. I'm always very uh, interested in like the, the best graphics that we, we can we can get, especially if it's like a real time rendering. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm interested in, because real time rendering means uh, you can simulate like it, it's basically you're teleporting to places. Wow. And now in real time, you can have, you know, exchanges with people. And then that's 
that's kind of what I was thinking about concerts, like you were you were saying, from digital then you f to the physical, because uh, physical is required to create a meaningful experience, connecting with uh, with the creator and the audience and things like that. I, I'm having visions where you could have a cre it's like a, a fully simulated VR experience where you show up in the room and then you can be in any type of play like the creator let's say I was mainly looking at it from the perspective of a podcast to be honest because I'm kind of in this space um, I'll give you that example so let's say there are uh, two or maybe three or four people in the room at this table they're really intelligent interesting individuals to listen to and as a participant now you could be anywhere at that table you could be one of the persons at the table you could be anywhere you could be an audience um, but but you can really feel the presence that you're like with them there like your teachers they're just like sharing some cool knowledge with you and uh, similarly i think for creators it would be kind of cool to like be with the creators at, on the stage or in the practice room like you can really be i mean there are some like primitive i guess uh, 360 video experiences right. that you could probably watch, but um, it's not like that. It's not you know, like that. Yeah. And I love it because one of the things we experimented with at WaveWorld as our last one was building this wave game product. And mm. ultimately, it was a game where you could connect deeper with the artists mm. that were in the game. So it was fully digital. Mm -hmm. And the winning prize, there was prize along the way, was this one on one concert with mm. that artist where we fly you out to go meet the artist and mm. spend a day with them. Mm -hmm. But as you're saying all this, I'm like, how can we bring this mm -hmm. as a one of one concert? Or mm -hmm. maybe it's your top 10 fans and they all feel like they're having this one on one concert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that without the restrictions of geography, I think yeah. we are opening up a whole, like, it's better than the current totally. internet native system we have sure. where everyone's just scrolling Instagram. I mm -hmm. think that's solving a lot, like yeah. way more than people think. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I've thought a lot about like what would happen then if you fully simulate um, all of your senses. Uh, will there be any difference left between the real experience and wow. the fully simulated one? And something inside of me says there will be something that something that we maybe the types of senses that we weren't fully aware of like uh on an energetic level when you have someone present in the room mm -hmm. uh there are some subtleties like a energetic uh type feeling of of like someone's resonance some someone's mm -hmm. energy and i think by fully simulating we, we'll start to develop that f uh, maybe muscle that we atrophied maybe we've had s some time in the past and, and now we, it's coming back to us we are like pinpointing the the, the delta basically and like oh wow now we're noticing it you know that's an amazing way of thinking about it like mm -hmm. what are these senses that are being underdeveloped mm -hmm. especially as we're so overstimulated even in the outside environment and yeah like will there be a difference like how can you simulate smell even right is like something that came up to me like what are these senses mm -hmm. that are harder to simulate yeah. and i mean we can we can probably get there like You're to me technology is very much surprising where i'm thinking of ready player one where they have the haptic suit and everything yeah yeah and i'd like to see those experiments of like you yeah. take a person and you're putting them yeah. through both of these experiences yeah. and can they tell the difference for sure do you think there will ever be a time i kind of go back and forth on that where we won't need a, a, a meat meat bag meat suit. suit like that right uh, to navigate uh, like uh, to navigate life or to navigate uh, existence like you know yeah i don't know yeah. it's like it's a hard one i really yeah. don't know like something tells me there is something inherently human like you mentioned this energetic thing mm -hmm. but maybe it's just so it gets so real mm -hmm. where we're already in that and i think mm -hmm. that's where that to me that like that simulation hypothesis mm -hmm. keeps on coming back up where mm -hmm. maybe we're already in this hologram maybe we're already outside of the meat suit yeah um and it's very possible to me i think most of it is we don't know we don't know and the complexity of the technology and the complexity of the universe. Yeah. Like what are other species is senses like, right? And now you're yeah. seeing like all of these, like we discovered aliens or blah, blah, blah. Like what is that technology mm -hmm. going to bring to our world? Exactly. Y yeah. So um, what I was going to uh, go with that, I see evolutionary um, like tr trait, like development of evolution is going from more physical, um, let's say more primitive, hu more primitive humans lived 
for the most part in very much in the physical do domain where they were handling rocks and tools and uh, they weren't really spending a whole lo a lot of time in their head like mm -hmm. thinking and planning ahead uh, but it is a, innately a h human th feature that uh, differentiated us from other hum uh, from other animals is that we can plan ahead mm -hmm. and so that capability has only been extending over long periods of time so evolution is basically this this or at least human evolution is the process of it, it feels like spending more and more time in those mental domains and mm -hmm. in those more ethereal domains. And now uh, most of us uh, doing either full time or, or partially uh, work online where we don't even have to uh, be in the physical space doing some things. It's, it's just doing the keyboard pressing and looking at the screen but most of the value that's happening it's in a like a hyper space in the phys in a more ethereal space mm -hmm. and, and it's almost feels like uh, that's the if you extrapolate that into the future maybe there will be a time where um, all the physical we're just gonna leave all of the physical there will be no more need because it's just too slow mm -hmm. like the physical domain is just has too much friction too much uh, and if for, for us to like really experience uh, other levels of, of life, we have to, um, you know, leave that this domain. I'm sure there will be time if we are getting there. Maybe there will be a, a hard stop where mm -hmm. to say like for no, no further. Right. Business, like yeah. you, you, your you need your body, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. what do you, any yeah, I could see that as one scenario. I also see the scenario where. Maybe like human evolution is basically us create, creating silicon life and then silicon life kind of continues mm -hmm. and we reach this point where we either need to merge with silicon life, mm -hmm. right? Like this neural link thing or mm -hmm. intelligence that is mm -hmm. non-human becomes so advanced that we just can't compete. So we actually, we actually have to upgrade our biology. Yeah. So there might be some some biotech that comes into that. I do think right now for me though, the spaces that do, we do inhabit online aren't the spaces like the one you're building. And I mm -hmm. think we need more of these types of spaces mm -hmm. for that ethereal realm to actually flourish and not lead to collapse. Because a lot of what I see right now is we're spending all this time online mm -hmm. and we're not getting the right amount of yeah. physical stimulation. And you're seeing that the body and the mind, right? This mind body problem Mm -hmm. it's two sides of the same coin, right? Mm -hmm. The nervous system yep. is so interlinked right. that I think we're not there yet. And a lot of what I have practiced is how do I still use my body? I and mean, like whatever I feel like I'm either having mm -hmm. mental health issues mm -hmm. or I'm having rumination. A lot of time it's not through the mind that gets me out of it. It's mm -hmm. through the body. Mm -hmm. And to me, what you're talking about building is super exciting because it's saying, how can we take mm -hmm. these elements of the body yep. and bring them into these spaces that are inevitably only going to become more and more encapsulated by yep. humans? And I don't know what the answer is. I think the answer is way more complex mm. because of AI, because of us mm -hmm. reaching to this point of, right. are we going to create another form of life through mm -hmm. evolution? And if so, mm -hmm how are we going to deal with that? Because it's gonna become autopoetic where right. it wants to survive itself. Mm -hmm. And these are the catastrophic risks that I think we're reaching up against that make the difference between some form of utopia or some form of dystopia. Yeah. And it'll probably be something in between. Yeah. And those are a lot of the things I do notice. I mean, I even notice just as a creator, just spending so much time distributing on Instagram or on Twitter. It just doesn't feel like the right place. Like yeah, something yeah, yeah. in my intuition is like, right. there's something more we're headed towards. Yep. And even just having this podcast here feels a lot more closer to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To me. Yeah, it's interesting. As you were saying, like to, some thoughts were coming up for me. Uh, you were saying like, oh, now we're building this super intelligence. Uh, I would also say uh, it, it's human intelligence is emerging uh, through through this uh, evolutionary process through through us and through our creations and in the same way how consciousness emerged uh, from 
complexification of uh, biological matter like cells came together and organs came together into like this org organism and now humans um, and and that's why when you said like oh we we definitely want to be cautious of uh, this super intelligence uh, not ending up in in this like dystopian type uh, future but I think it's less likely because um, look at humans why would we um, uh, harm our physical body even though i mean yeah so like it, it's almost like cells uh, create this super organism uh, that is not just a collection of all of the parts but now some it's something greater than that it's sitting on top of it um it, it has its own new level of complexity of new levels levels of behavior let's say you can't describe culture uh, th through learning how biology works like it's a different layer of complexity and i feel like um, similarly with uh, super or like a uh, non-human intelligence there's will be a new layer of complexity uh, that will be just sitting on top uh, so you ha you need to have the whole stack mm. to be able to exist like mm. this interesting i mean i would hope so i would hope that that that's the world that does emerge where this super intelligence is aligned and understands that the mm. underlying complexity led to its complexity You're right and i don't know though because i do see humans are causing harm to other sides of the species right and you it's mm -hmm. not even because it's this planned effect that people are trying to do it's more we have so many of us and it's so hard to coordinate past dunbar's number where we really evolved in these smaller tribes and mm -hmm. we were able to create technology that just exponentially got us to the top of the mm -hmm. food chain and the economic system is incentivized to for example you there's more money to be made off killing a whale than saving a whale right and mm -hmm. to me it's now become an arms race mm. of these companies that were developing super intelligence that mm. when you look at them originally, they were the ones trying to solve the AI alignment problem. Mm -hmm. You had Google DeepMind that was really ahead in AI, yeah. and then you had OpenAI come in and be like, oh, we need to like solve these AI problems, and then mm -hmm. they got bought up by Microsoft and had to go to market, yeah. and now you see Anthropic, and it's like, now we're trying to solve the AI alignment problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you tie the markets in this arms race across companies and countries, you're not able to have as much strategy as you would like, yeah. because you're forced to go to market, and if you listen to like Sam Altman, he's saying this is the way to do it, right? We want to get people accustomed to AI in iterations so it just doesn't bubble up in 10 years and is this wild thing, which I yeah. think is a valid point as well. Mm -hmm. I just think we don't know what it's like to create a technology that's auto-poetic. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole like paperclip maximizer thing, right? Yeah, Where yeah, it's yeah. just like, right. how, do we, how do we prevent AI from thinking that we are the problem? Right. right. And right. it just gets to the point where it's like maybe we don't need humans mm -hmm. in their current form because they're too slow. They're too physical. Right. 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 And I see I see either some type of real strategy being done from these AI companies or we're probably just going to become an organism that merges with them. Yeah, I think. Right. Like it'll be a transitionary phase where we are this intelligence and complexity underneath the super intelligence. Yeah. And there's going to be a weird point where some human's going to be like, what if I join them? Right. And then you get a point where right. how can you not join when so many have joined? It's like having an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like right now there's a couple yeah. Yeah. movements and collectives that are like back to these no smartphones. Yep. But if you take away your iPhone for a week, you notice how it's yep. like it's become an extension of our body already. And yeah, I'd like to hope that it's an optimistic worldview. And, and the more and more I like want to believe that but i'm not sure the techno optimist perspective even though I've, i really started there mm. um so at this point i'm kind of just agnostic on where it's all going to go mm -hmm. yeah i tend to be in the optimistic camp um and doing everything that i can to create like basically putting my energy into manifesting that type of future how probable that future to manifest um 
I don't know, uh, but I choose to dedicate all of my energy to 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 that probability. Even if it's a small probability, it's, it's still possible, and I choose to dedicate my energy towards that. You know? I think we need. I think we need the most amount of people doing that. Mm-hmm, like the mm-hmm. most amount of people doing the same thing you're doing. Mm-hmm. And one way I think. Uh, uh, what would help to make things better is to bring more humanness, more deep human connection, authenticity into the digital domain. Because I feel like a lot of a lot of times digital domain exists for self profit. Like uh, there's a lot of uh, self motive uh, motives. Uh, profiting type of intents uh, a lot of businesses are there for, for that reason and there are just not enough authentic real human expression online and if AI let's say gets out of hand and it's starting to just you know see what's what's happening in the world to try to understand the whole topology of humans like what what is how it's already have pretty decent understanding of like everything right the, the more data we have to feed it of oh we're not just this self-serving right. you know monkeys that, that you know don't care about each other but we actually have something greater i feel like it, we need more of that online mm. how do we get that yeah we we need to create spaces and and systems and technologies to um invite more of that human is at scale so it's very accessible one way how i'm approaching it is like envision this types of studios all around the country where any human just both humans can come in and have your dialogue like this authentic expression and then create systems that would just uh easily blast that uh, onto mm. the the world that people don't so remove friction of um capturing and then distributing uh this authenticity into the into the world i love what you just said i love like the removing friction of capturing this Mm. documentation process and then Mm -hmm. the the distribution side which is also yeah super high friction yeah i wonder i want to ask like what do you think makes humans and makes humans the most connected in these outside digital spaces or these spaces that are not digital yeah and how have you been thinking about creating that online, right? Like, yeah. th- like what you're saying here, like removing the camera, removing yeah. Yeah. like the mic, and yeah, like how are you thinking mm-hmm. about that? Yeah, I think uh, a big uh, thing that really brings people together is sense of uh, deep uh, connection, presence. Uh, embodied, so you are embodied yourself. You're very present with yourself, and then you recognizing that there's another embodied human uh, in front of you. And eye contact, eye gazing is a, mm-hmm. a, a proximity, like being pretty close to someone. You're a lot more connected to them than they're a little bit further away. Uh, I think just uh, uh, piggybacking on like a pr- more primitive uh, function of humans of like connection and um, you know proximity, contact, uh, smell, like uh, being in the environments that are seducive to uh, be relaxed and comfortable and uh, you don't have to worry about like uh, maybe uh, an outsider watching you or uh, being seen. Like you're very comfortable and um, uh, feel connected and like you feel like you're part of one group that people don't judge you and yeah space spaces like that we need to create more um group type smaller group type scenarios where mm. people can really feel seen recognized and understood and respected and supported in those yeah these types of spaces i love that i think even just being on video calls and mm. how there is like even when you're looking at someone's eyes you're looking mm. at the camera you're not really looking yeah, at them totally yeah and yeah i think even just noticing the younger generation like my younger siblings like they grow up on these apps they lack mm. a lot of that right 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 yeah that eye contact mm-hmm. and these things that you're forced to do mm-hmm. when you do have the space for that Mm -hmm. and i wonder how we can leverage that even within wave world because as you're talking about them like i want to create an experience that Mm. Mm. uses this Mm. to connect people because i've met so many people online and we're connected but a lot of the time the strongest connection comes when we finally meet at a conference yeah yeah, you know and I think what you're building here and like yeah. having a network of studios yeah. all around the world where you yeah. can get there and eventually this is something where I don't even have to be here. Maybe the other person is, mm-hmm. you know, on the other side of the globe. Mm-hmm. 
Man, you know what I've, I've tried also? That was uh, also a very unique experience. I watched the videos that were recorded here when somebody's looking straight into the camera while they're talking to you. I watched them in VR uh, where the room is dark and I scaled the, the video just right to feel like they're right in front of me. Wow. And, it, and it's, a, it's a very different uh, like a sense of presence. You really feel like they're pretty present. One idea that I, uh, I had that I don't know if it's possible to implement, I think it should be. So envision that your computer display, uh, which um, often people have a pretty big displays these days, like a 27, 30 inch big display. Now imagine that it's a window. It's almost like this window uh, where it's tracking where you're looking and it's basically adapting your, your eyesight. And now there's another person uh, like that in the video that you really feel like you're just standing in front of a window and they're right behind that window. And then you can talk to them that way instead of uh, like uh, like a broken zoom where yeah. everyone like you're not fully there like you're, yeah you're not here you're not there you're I don't know if it's even better than a phone call because on the phone call it's a little bit more intimate like you're yeah. there with them on zoom you're distracted by your own f video and yeah it's so true. I think yeah. I've worked a lot remotely with teams mm -hmm. and there's something that's lacking mm -hmm. from just being on Zoom calls all day. For sure. And yeah, that piece that you're talking about you removed in the studio, which is the self-monitoring piece mm. and mm. that the current distribution system has exacerbated. Like mm -hmm. how is this going to be presented or how is this going to perform? Yeah, yeah. And that's the part like to bring it full circle that I find myself struggling a lot while in my creative process like those thoughts come up right mm -hmm. how is this perceived how is this distributed mm -hmm. i think removing that and getting closer to that authentic expression mm -hmm. of yourself which is super vulnerable yeah like, you know you don't even want to do it sometimes For where sure. we're so accustomed to just showing this highlight reel but even thinking to myself my favorite artist i love just watching them in the studio like when it's just the camera's just For on sure. and they're streaming and yeah, yeah. it's this real imperfection this mm. how can you bring this imperfection back in mm -hmm. where we focus so much on presenting this perfect view of ourselves mm -hmm. and to me that also has caused a lot of issues in the way we consume information mm -hmm. and i think you already start to see a trend of people wanting these whether it be like these transcendental experiences mm -hmm. or these retreats yeah, or these immersive. online courses. Yeah, yeah. I think mm -hmm. humans are craving it. Totally, totally. It's, it's yeah, there's actually, if you're in the space of like starting a business, that's like a, a really profitable industry to move into. I see more and more people talking about authenticity, connection, community, like that. that's the new way of, of doing things. Because uh, the, the old way of just um, feeding you some kind of like ads and uh, disconnected type experiences motivated by profits uh, i think they're slowly dying out or at, at least i hope so at least in my world in my reality i see uh glimpses of new way of of interacting in those spaces in those mm -hmm. digital domains yeah yeah me too i think i even see the trend of a lot of the people and corporations that were doing that mm -hmm. realizing they need the content and at first it's just like oh we're just publishing content but then they realize that if the founder just gets up and mm -hmm. talks about the actual mission just mm -hmm. to a camera or mm -hmm. to people, yeah. people believe in it. And yeah. they even show like podcast listeners, they, I mean, listen, sometimes people listen to a podcast every week to an episode. That's more time than they spend with their family sometimes. So Crazy. they are so dedicated to you as a listener because mm -hmm. you're authentically just speaking what you believe in and what you're researching and what you're exploring or you're having guests that are very interested in that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when people have the highest intent to buy, even though they're not being sold to. Mm -hmm. And I think the business world is realizing that slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. But the practitioners and the artists and the people that are leading from the heart are usually the ones to show it first. Yeah, yeah. And they don't necessarily have the intention, oh, how do we monetize it? But it's more like they really enjoy the process and, and money just kind of mm -hmm. comes with, with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Or even if like the money is an intention, it's how can I make this thing self-sustainable and to keep it flowing and to mm -hmm. propagate it more. Mm -hmm. And 
to me, I think a lot of artists and creators need that side, right? Mm -hmm. We need more of the funding and the business side so we can have more sure. of these experiences. Could you share with me a vision of the future that you would uh, sign up for and like something that would excite you to move towards that type of vision? Yeah, I think it's a lot of the things we talked about today. So a future where the spaces we inhabit are around authenticity, are around connection, and most likely we're going more and more online. So mm -hmm. we need things like this. Mm -hmm. A world where the body is still important, even if it's in the digital layer where we mm -hmm. still have a relationship with our body. This mind-body connection mm -hmm. is, is an illusion and people realize it. Mm -hmm. uh, a world where the agriculture, like the food systems yeah. as well, as well as the physical environment right because that's a whole other piece of even when we go online like you still have this body that unless you figure out mm -hmm. longevity side of things yeah. right how can we have the most upgraded system mm -hmm. so humans don't have as much rivalry so there isn't as much war so people can be empathetic to each other's beliefs and each other's desires and ultimately we have all these resources and they're allocated in a way where People are super poor and people are super rich and the systems we've come up with, communism, capitalism, like they're all reaching their planetary boundaries and mm -hmm. technology is just creating abundance. So mm -hmm. I want to see a world where we still flourish and thrive as humans in this abundance era and where people are open to conversation, where people are open to stepping into the other person's shoes mm -hmm. and thinking about okay, this is what I believe, but if I had to argue or explain what I think the complete opposite of me believes, how mm -hmm. do I step into that? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think the future is such a mystery and it's always surprised me. Like yeah, every, even yeah. every piece of technology, every like yeah. thing I've been interested in. So I would say a curious future as well for humans to be optimistically curious. Yeah, curiosity is one of the biggest uh, motivators, drivers that uh, uh, get me moving. Um, I'm very curious about understanding. I think uh, a big concept like understanding gives me that drive. And to understand, you have to be curious before understanding. Uh, you won't understand something if you don't care about it and you don't even attempt to understand. Um, so, uh, yeah, so for whatever, and that's the reason uh, for me to starting the, the podcast of Human Future is because you can't really talk about the future uh, until you understand what have happened before, mm -hmm. what different patterns are, are unraveling to really project that like, or it, it's a, I don't know, it's a, for me, it's a really fun exercise to think about what could what could the future look like and then as it's unraveling is like oh it was right here i was totally off here and i think over time uh, you might get better at predicting the future if you you've practiced for like uh, consistently for like 20 30 years uh, intentionally putting your effort in in predicting the future and see what the outcomes are next time you're like oh no i think it's gonna go this way yeah so i think um yeah so I, when i was like coming up with the topic for I knew that I want to start having conversations on like a weekly basis and uh, and I was like oh what would be the topic that I won't get tired to talk about um, and and yeah it came to me after some some time like it took some decent amount of time uh, to like that future is the the underlying theme of any topic that I'm interested in talking about whatever topic technology spirituality this and that like evolution evolution is a big like big interest of mine like mm -hmm. how things are evolving and where they're where we headed like where where is that yeah it's cool i love that i think the future is so interesting because you mentioned it earlier like through evolution it's what made us unique organisms that mm -hmm. we could predict so far mm -hmm. into the future it's also our kryptonite because i think it's a lot of why people get stuck in their heads yeah. when they're thinking about it more from a a centric point of view like what is mm. my future right but even in like psychology they mention and like in man's search for meaning right like the thing that gives meaning is this vision of a future self mm -hmm. of this positive future self yep and it's so interesting to be thinking about the future in the present and yeah i think even ai hasn't got to a point 
where our nervous system is at predicting the future, where mm -hmm. we still have this predictive model of the future mm -hmm. just through evolution, not from like a long-term technological point of view, but just mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. um, that's super interesting. I love that you came to that realization. Yeah. To this. You, uh, one one uh, other thing that I wanted to share, how I see it. So I feel like technology, the more things we out so now there's intelligence uh, non-human intelligence and the robotics and before we thought only humans can do this function or that function and now a lot of them are just uh, kind of fall, falling off and now we we don't need like sometimes we question what is actually what does it mean to be a human and I believe that's in the that's a, a very important um, exercise that humans are going through by outs outsourcing like finding ways to do human function because the better we do that the closer we get to the source of what it is to be human to like to the essence of who are we and and to understand that we're not the body we have the body that the 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 vehicle through which with which we navigate the world and it's a very intricate like really awesome amazing body that we probably won't be able to replicate for a really long time if ever like it, because it's not just the i feel like a biological uh meat suit but it's also this spiritual channel that's able to pick up the the signal from the like the the, the the true source where we come from mm. uh, it comes through the physical body it's like a vessel through the vessel like all of the energy centers they're all interconnected it's not just uh, again just the physical part of your body but it also is connected to the energetic centers and, and things like that so yeah plus the rest of the species and the environment right it's like this yeah so interconnected i love the idea of like what is the source right and mm -hmm. the source being this all-encompassing thing yeah where you are part of the whole mm -hmm. and you're separate from the whole at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. The point you made about we are like through these technologies and I was speaking about this with someone yesterday, we're mm -hmm. going to realize what's actually inherently human because people right. are seeing, yeah. oh, like you thought the art was human. Like mm -hmm. actually, no, like mm -hmm. it exactly. is very creative, yep. you know, so where yep. where is the real? That's right. Exactly. I love that point. Yeah. And then also recognizing like, where does it all come from and really tuning into the inner voice the our higher self to the the channel through which we uh through which ideas come from like tuning into our intuition the more subtle uh, abilities of humans that we won't be able to replicate for a little while and but the and that's where all of the value and importance will pour into like the, the more stuff we can replicate robots can do it for for zero cost mm -hmm. uh, once we get to the point of you know abundance of intelligence already getting there and an abundance of energy um, most of the things are going to completely lose value uh, but what will stay valuable is what we can't replicate easily right that, mm -hmm. that's the human part mm -hmm. right that's so beautiful that's beautifully said like he's, uh, <laughs> yeah. i love that <laughs> um let's see um yeah so maybe share a little bit about the so I mean, maybe in the notion of kind of like wrapping up uh, to share with people how they can find you, how they can maybe support you, uh, what you're doing and yeah, some, some last thoughts there. For sure. Yeah. I'm karma.wave or karma wave on most platforms. Twitter is mostly where I share my thoughts and we have a community called wave world. That's very much community driven. We run a lot of these experiments. We have conversations around topics like this more related to creativity and music and art and we have a chat that you can join um, via the wave world discord or via the wave world telegram that you can find at wave world underscore on twitter and yeah i think the people that are interested in these ideas will cross paths I, yeah. that's what i've really realized like similar like how we've crossed paths sure. somehow this universe just connects the people together mm -hmm. and yeah just excited for everyone that's thinking about these 